We come to the last talk before the coffee break, and we're happy to have with us Judith Blair. Who are you, Judith? Oh, she's here, so give me a mic. So Judith is from the Judith is coming. Is from the Jackson Laboratory in Barbo, and she's a molecular geneticist. Let me get this definition. And uh, she's one, uh, I would say, of the two persons which have played an immense role in making sure, I mean, that all of the work which is going around ontology, the gene ontology, I mean, uh, happens. The second person is, of course, Michael Ashburner, who is also here. And in parallel to that and before that, uh, she is, I mean, uh, one of the principal investigators in the most genome informatics group. And everyone which use, I mean, I mean, so this database, I would say that if we want to look at two model database in the field of eukaryote, we have MGI for mouse and we have Flybase from Drosophila, and those are really two models of where people have spent so much effort building a compendium of data, of knowledge, which is really tremendously useful to the user community. So, this should be thanked with all our colleagues for that. As Links at her stores from the University of Connecticut. I wasn't sure if it was in this campus you were or not. And Boston, Harvard University, Washington DC, when she worked at Smithsonian. She was then at Tiger, to Rockville, and of course at Barbo. I limited the uh, violins to two names, Michael Ashburner and uh, Shannon Epic, Michael for Go and Shannon for MGI. So thank you for being here. Thank you very much for having me here. I want to first uh, acknowledge that I think I'm the person who perhaps did not come the farthest, but certainly took the longest, having just arrived this morning, uh, late last night. And I want to congratulate SwissPro and say happy 20th anniversary. Um, and first off, I must acknowledge that uh, while I, I and Michael are involved in the starting of the go, it also involved very deeply Susie Lewis, and Mike Cherry, Susie being with uh, now at uh, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories, and Mike Cherry with with the yeast databases. And I will be talking about um, model organism databases and the development of ontologies. And I'm very happy also uh, to follow uh, Dr. Rost here today because a lot of the talks I've heard today have involved predictions based on what we know in the biological realm at this point, and that is the work that I and my colleagues have been working towards um, providing to the research community is the um, high quality annotations for our known information so that they can be used in these kind of predictive analyses that we've been hearing about today. So the perspective here is that uh, biology is now a data-driven science. Um, we have many genomes and genome-sized data sets but we use comparative genomics for biomedicine. Data integration is essential to the scientific endeavor, and I will show you some of the work that I've been involved with my colleagues in doing there, both within the GO and within the Mouse Genome Informatics Group. And bioontologies bio are having a significant impact on this work, both in the ability of uh, integrating the information, providing access to the information, and ultimately uh, to provide bioontologies as, as the core resource for reasoning over genomic sized uh, information sets. But there are many challenges, and I will talk briefly about some of them. Um, most particularly, can we actually capture biological systems in their completeness in a computable form, and how do we cope with merging and changing data? Today, now, we have a lot of people in this room working with models and predictions, but it's the working biologists that we have yet to convince of the value of providing these standards and ontologies in informing their work. And I will not talk about today, but I'm also deeply involved in the intersection between clinical trials, biomedical literature, and the formal structuring of biological information. So, briefly, 
Um, as I mentioned, many hundreds of genome sequences, something like 1,300, 1,800 genome sequencing projects, several hundreds in the pipeline, a couple hundred already sequenced genomes, and coming along transcriptomes and proteomes and the mouse, of course, involved in the phantom project. We heard just briefly some data on that. Hundreds of thousands, millions of data points. Again, we're developing protein interaction networks, and one of the complexities there is about 270 different pathway databases right now. And what we really want to do is create the information structure between the genomic uh, information generated in electronic form through the genome projects to the phenotypic and um, organismal level information that we have from uh, individual research groups. Data integration is a very important part of this process. Um, and the biological databases, particularly the model organism databases, work very hard to build high quality, highly integrated data resources. These are not sustainable across uh, for, to have for every single organism, but there are a core set of research model organisms for which this is of value and for which the resulting um, integrated data sets provide the structure for um, doing model predictions. And I will talk briefly now about the mouse genome informatics situation and then go to how MGI uses ontologies to support data integration and access. Um, mouse genome informatics, as, as um, Amos mentioned, is the community informatics resource for the laboratory mouse. We um, work very closely in the annotation of the genome sequence. We incorporate all the expression data and have a large role to play with the representation of mouse models for human diseases. Um, and the objective then is to facilitate the use of the mouse as a model for human biology and disease. Biological data at this scale is very heterogeneous. We have um, phenotype annotations. We have a lot of different kinds of mapping data. We have, um, uh, I'm not sure what I'm doing here for a, uh, um, uh, marker, but, um, and uh, all of this is to be backed up by, all this information is coming primarily from two sources. One is the biomedical literature, which is an experiment by experimental source, and the other is large data loads from other people generating mouse data sets. The data acquisition for this group is constant. This lists all the different groups from which we ex uh, obtain information or exchange information, and included on here is a Unipro Tremble data set uh, for the mouse group. We do a, a weekly exchange of information um, and are involved in a process that I call co-curation of the data for mouse. Um, and so a lot of the information feeds back and forth um, between these groups. But it's a lot of groups. We have a whole data load process. We're constantly refreshing the information. Um, and it involves a mixture of computational as well as uh, human curation to get the uh, relationships correct. Here's a snapshot of the content, a recent content. Um, noticing particularly the last number is a, um, pushing on 8 million sequences that are integrated into this system um, with about uh, 28,000 genes right now with sequence data. That's a little high, um, but we, it's easier to merge than split, so we bring the data in and then uh, curate it as we go along. Um, notice the 20,000 uh, genes with protein sequence information, that's relationships uh, curated between the mouse genome informatics group and the Swiss probe group. Um, and about 17,000 genes with uh, Go annotations. Also, um, 15,000 genes for which we have a highly um, supported orthology relationships, and these relationships are very important as we heard previous, the previous speaker talk about the use of ortho orthologs to um, uh, infer possible function from another organism. And for our purposes, we work um, primarily within the mammalian groups of mouse, human, and rat. This data integration is a very hard job. We have several automated processes that allow us to get through first passes, but our goal is to provide uh, accuracy, um, the highest level of accuracy possible with the relationship between um, genes and the protein and uh, nucleotide sequences that represent those functional gene um, uh, objects. And so we have a series of filters and then a series of curators that look through what we call buckets. 
Um, the easy ones, for example, in comparing here ensemble and the MGD gene list are the ones in the first bucket, the top one, when there's um, good correspondence, the first two buckets either have. And so then we look, as we go down, they become more and more complicated and allows us to uh, continue to refresh these data sets. Right now we're working uh, heavily with the Build 36, um, getting that integrated since we provide a lot of the functional annotations for the genes for the mouse genome sequence. Um, this is summary is from Build 34, but you see it's not just Ensemble that we work with. We also work with NCBI, with Tiger gene indices, NIAG indices, DOTS gene indices, and all of these go through the bucketization process. All of them are integrated into the representation of the mouse sequence set um, represented at the Mouse Genome Informatics Group. And I should say that uh, just as I mentioned um, uh, and has been mentioned, Michael and Susie and Mike, and working with the gene ontology, it's my colleagues, Carol Bolt, who does most of the work on the sequence uh, evaluations, but also Janan Epic, who was mentioned, who does much of the phenotype work, an original founder of MGD, and uh, 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 Martin Ringwald, who does a lot of the expression work, Joel and Richardson and um, Jim Caden, who are responsible for the production management and database uh, developments for our groups. And these people I'll bring up at the end, but again and again, this is a com community effort to provide the core basis of high quality data from which um, other groups can uh, do functional work and evaluate new emerging genomes. <clears throat> well, having all this data, we want to ask complex questions. And while because of the uh, effort to create this database, this integrated data set, we have all the information, but now we actually are trying to work with controlled vocabularies and ontologies. Here we see ion channel activity as one of the gene ontology terms in this complex query. This query asks for genes on chromosome 11 between a certain genome coordinate space, um, which um, are annotated to ion channel activity or one of the subterms, um, with the phenotype in either the behavioral or neurological tree of the um, portion of the mammalian phenotype ontology and then sorting them by gene coordinates. And we can ask these kind of queries because of the effort that's gone into the data integration for this mouse set. One of the questions that comes up and where ontologies are also important is who's the authority for any of this naming or any of this semantic standardization? And for the mouse, we serve as the authority for the gene structure, gene symbol and name, for allele symbols and names, and for all strain um, names. Um, for the community and have for a long time. And with the development of the semantic standards to, uh, propagated by the gene ontology, which I'll talk about next, um, we um, are the provider of the integrated set of mouse in, uh, annotations to the GOBE database. Now those, that integrated set includes many annotations made by the Swiss Pro group and by some other groups as well. And so we all work together on um, providing the the common uh, functional annotation set, um, all to the very high standards. What we're seeing now is the development of a network of these highly curated uh, data sets uh, that are sharing and uh, coming to a common representation of what we know about the biology of these particular organisms, these uh, model organism groups. But the knowledge is in the details, and this is where we run into the problems with the biomedical literature where people use free text. Um, I'm not going to talk much about that today, other than to say part of the curation process is to bring the exact experimental data for mouse into the mouse genome informatics system. And for that, we use controlled terms from structured vocabularies and ontologies to annotate what we know from the literature about complex biological systems. And the uniqueness here is that now the information that we're presenting is where the experiments have actually been done in a mouse system. And this is, uh, I'm talking about mouse here, but this is the same for all the model organism groups, for fly, for yeast, for worm. The annotations provided under our new paradigms are, are specific for those organisms. And so now when you combine and look at orthology or comparative information, you can track back where the data actually came from and use that. The knowledge is in the details. Here we see uh, first um, some from the mammalian phenotype ontology, that paper had uh, this terminology um, indexed to it, along with some free text of actual details. Here we see the annotation to an abnormal neuron, um, to muscle atrophy, and these are all in a classification system that allows you to get access to multiple mouse models 
that have been indexed to these terms. So as part where the model organism databases started as rela typically relational database systems holding the information um, and doing integration, we're now um, supplementing and, and expanding, um, improving these integrated systems with the use of structured vocabularies and ontologies, and there are many of them and many more to be developed. Um, uh, and Susie Lewis, who's now one of the heads of the National um, uh, Center for Biomedical Ontologies, um, has, is, along with Mark Newson and others, are taking a leadership role in looking at across the board at all the different ontologies and how they can be useful to us. These are the ones we're currently using in the mouse genome information mouse genome informatics system. And they include, uh, right now, um, um, one of the most important we were talking over lunch is a disease ontology where right now what we are doing is providing precise associations between a mouse model and an OMIM record. We really need better representation of the disease ontology, um, and we're seeing the development, too, of pathways and uh, the phenotypes, other aspects. There are many different ways of looking at the underlying information that we need. So bioontologies are, are having a significant impact. Uh, they are integral to the integration process, as I've been pointing out. Their use enhances our access to knowledge because it allows us to get robust and complete results. It facilitates the ability to formulate complex queries. Um, as I showed you, what we can ask queries, such as what genes in mouse have a role in pattern formation of the limb and are located on chromosome 19. And this is particularly important with my colleagues who are doing a lot of QTL analysis. Um, and gene searching um, in their work, and also on functional organization of the genome. And finally, ontologies support data analysis and allow the data integration and data exploration, um, some of which we see in the talks today about modeling and prediction of protein function. I referred to the gene ontologies, and many of you have most of you are probably aware of them. Um, just to remind you, there are four categories, about 20,000 terms, including genome features, molecular function, biological process, and cellular component. The community works on ontology development, on providing the annotations then to those ontologies, and on providing tools and resources for use by uh, biological researchers. There are many active groups involved in this, and I'll show you some of them in a minute. And there's a widespread community use of the Go now for functional data analysis and for comparative genome um, investigations. It's turned, it started as a practical response by the yeast, fly, and mouse communities to provide functional annotations in the context of comparative research. And it's, it has proved itself to be great utility um, to a data, particularly to the data-driven biologist who is working to integrate and uh, um, search out information across many genomes. Here is uh, the snapshot of the GO consortium group. These people are all actively involved from 17 different communities um, in the GO, work of the GO as a community pro pro um, process. They are primarily working with highly curated database groups. They are almost all PhD level biologists who have worked, are now working in bioinformatics, and they do, but it does include some computa uh, computational biologists and some um, software engineers. And so it's a very large group dedicated to working together as they work to represent the particular biology of their model organism. This is the extent of the participating groups. These groups all are, were represented at the last gene ontology consortium meeting, and you can see that taking together, this represents a large cohort of the functional annotation community, providing the uh, structured information that is being used then to make predictions for emerging genomes. Um, the lists on the left are, have been involved in the Go work for a long time. Zfin and Tiger have been contributing a lot. Reactome is a pathway representation. And then, um, Pathogens, uh, the PAMGO, Sanger groups, um, farm animals with the emergence of the cattle genome, other groups are looking to the GO for uh, guidance in the functional annotation of their, or of their genomes. One of the things to, I wanted to point out here was um, we have many things happening in the GO, and three particular things. We continue to work on ontology development. I'll talk a moment in that about that. We are committed to the in-depth um, 
annotation of nine reference genomes that includes mouse and fly and yeast and E. coli um, and, and some others, worm. Uh, and for that, what we are looking to is to, uh, again, work with the biomedical literature, with the actual experiments done in that organism, and to provide uh, functional annotations from those, that biomedical literature. And then providing uh, and sharing with the community methods for um, using then these core annotation sets from these reference genomes to um, provide the annotations for new genomes. That's another thing that we've been deeply involved in. And you may hear more about this, I'm not sure, but Michael's talking about on Friday, whenever he's talking, but he will be talking about some of these, these efforts, I'm sure. And the goal here is to support the users of these highly curated functional annotation sets and to advance uh, the ability to do genome analysis. Well, bioontologies is they're currently, um, are currently enabling science even today, and they're used in four particular ways as terminologies or classifications, enabling data aggregation and for data mining and statistical analysis. I'll just show you a couple of this. Um, here's we just see in the integration process, we get a lot of information about a gene. Here are the Go annotations. The annotations are the actual connections between the genome information and the Go. The experiments provide the data that enables us to annotate gene products. And the annotations are the assertions. There's evidence, the gene product is best classified using the term, the source of the evidence and the other information is included, and there's agreement on the meaning of the term, and that's the most important thing. And so this is how we see this information set fed out to other resources as a glossary set, for, predominantly, just a list of terms. But go ontologies, bioontologies are even more useful as classifications where we can cluster information and provide initial annotations. Here we see where through a, a computational analysis, a set of relatively uncharacterized recon genes have been identified in this clustering matrix as being part of cell adhesion matrix, matrix adhesion proteins. And we are starting to provide um, graphical representations. Here we see rat annotations and human annotations for orthologs. So we're using the orthology data curated separately and then looking at, uh, simultaneously at the annotation sets for experimental data from that particular organism. So we've started to do some data mining. Here is an example where we have done, uh, from the curation of the literature, gather together protein-protein interaction information. When we glean all this information from our annotation sets, we can then provide a set of total um, interaction uh, data for the mouse from experimental data in the mouse. So none of this is predicted, and Go is increasingly used for various aspects of data mining, including, as uh, many, some of you may be uh, familiar, using Go for functional predictions um, for, as we, and is used extensively for functional predictions for microarray results. Well, where is Go going? It's very useful for digesting a large amount of data. We continue to refine the Go. We are involved with the, uh, formal ontologists in various aspects of um, making the Go ontological representations better, which will drive us towards being able to reason with the Go. And I'm not going to discuss this, but I point you again to the, um, uh, the National Center for Biomedical Ontologies as well as the Go website for information about the development there. But the most difficult thing we face is verifying and maintaining domain representations that best reflect the current knowledge of the working biologists. And so we have started a series of um, uh, workshops to involve the working biologists in the development of the Go and in development of the annotation to the Go, um, because we depend upon that expert knowledge um, to be able to continue to accommodate change in our knowledge of biological systems. There's two things that we're doing. We have annotation-driven ontology development happening within all the groups and particularly within the reference genome groups. And secondly, we have domain-specific ontology development workshops. So the an annotation ontology cycle, so we've developed a process now for deep annotation of disease-specific genes. So we've started, we're starting the reference genomes, are starting with genes identified as being involved in human diseases, and then their orthologs in the model organism groups, and collecting all the literature and doing in-depth annotation for those genes. And what that does involve almost every time, as we're developing this, we discover that we need to extend the actual, the terminology in the gene ontology, and we are working hard to accommodate that. 
So it's an iterative process where we um, bring into the, as, as part of providing extensive annotation for a set of genes that have been identified as high priority, we also are extending the representation of the biology in the gene ontology. Secondly, we have ontology development workshops, um, bringing together domain experts and ontology developers for the go. We're currently running about two workshops a year. Our initial one was on a metabolism and cell cycle. Recently, uh, we ran one on immunology and defense response. Um, most recently, in June, on early CNS, central nervous system development. Our next one will be on um, uh, neural tube and retinal development, and we're also looking at a further one next spring on starting on heart and vascular mature development. So in the ontology workshop in November, we added uh, close to 800 terms and restructured the whole immunolo immunology um, subtree of the GO, and this is now out for review and available to the public. All the, GO all the GO work is open source and publicly available. It's now on our SourceForge site if anyone would like to review it, but we have been involving a lot of immunologists in this work. And in the CNS development workshop, um, we also have now submitted about 800 terms for new terms for the gene ontology. Um, one of the things we're finding is that in doing this work, we're running into a known issue of the intersection between anatomies and functional terms, um, and we're working on how to best do the um, relationships between ontologies, between anatomy, cell types, and uh, molecular function ontologies. So we're working on various projects involved in ontology alignment. Here we're looking at cell types in GO versus cell types in the cell ontology, and we're trying to bring these into alignment. And we've done much of similar things with mapping between different key terminologies, including with the Swiss Pro keyword set and aligning that with the GO. We continue to do this work, and it continues to facilitate the intersection of the various semantic representations available now in the literature and in these ontologies. While there still exist significant challenges, still, for bioontology development and use, um, one of them, um, it's very hard to work on the visualization and querying of all the um, representations. And um, so how, I'll show you one example of what we're trying. And uh, increasingly, too, this is a very, uh, it's a expensive proposition because for these genomes you need high, you need very highly skilled curators who understand both the biology can, and reading the medical literature and the structure of annotation systems for these databases. So um, we work and continue to work to involve and obtain funding for more um, ability to get that data in and to be able to update the information that we have. So we have mouse models for human diseases, many other kinds of information. I focused on molecular data, but bringing it along molecular ontologies and then representing um, uh, physiology and diseases is a big problem. One of the things we're doing here is that we have to combine many different kinds of core ontologies to describe complex biological systems. And we're trying this by taking a disease-centric approach taking a small um, classification for a set of diseases here, the uh, gangliosidoses, and then providing the information from multiple ontologies, including the gene ontology, the phenotype ontology, anatomies, to create an ontological representation of a disease set, doing annotations to this, and this allows us to navigate between human clinical data and mouse model data on the basis of the ontologies and to link back into these systems. Um, and look at the underlying experimental data. So there are many ways that people are using this information. We're trying to extend this to combine the ontologies to be able to explore a particular biological space in this, in the mouse pool. So finally, I would like to say that I think that the gene ontology and other ontologies working as an extension and um, um, of the initial work by the model organism databases has brought a new level of uh, ability to our computational analysis and um, use of this genome size data that we face today. So from biological C to biological knowledge, we see that we get um, Go analysis tools that are used in order to provide information that's um, predictions and testing that goes into the experimental literature. 
improve this experimental literature, improves the Go annotations. It's reflected in the mods and in the information and resources such as SwissPro, NymphPro. And then these information are used in the comparative sense for the initial analysis of new genomes and new mappings that provide us again with the ability to um, generate new hypotheses and go back in the in data uh, experimental system again. So I'd like to summar, summar, summarize here by saying that biological data is voluminous and complex. Data integration is hard work. Bioontologies are providing semantic standards and then are currently aiding in data visualizations, analysis, and transformations. But there are many, many uh, challenges still remaining. It will be a lot of hard work to see the full power of what we know we can do with these systems. Just some acknowledgement uh, from the Mouse Genome Informatics Group. As I mentioned, Carol Bolch and Ann Epping, Jim Caden, Joel Richardson, and Martin Ringwald, instrumental in the, getting this group up and running and keeping it going. Um, the Gene Ontology uh, Group, led by Michael Ashburner, Mike Cherry, Susanna Lewis, and myself. And then this particular GO group at Mouse Genome Informatics, some of whose work you saw today. Alex Steele, who works in immunology. Mary Dolan does a lot of the graphical visualizations work. Harold Drabkin is a biochemist looking at protein-protein interaction work. And David Hill, a developmental biologist, who has helped a lot in the development of uh, deep annotation work and ontology development in mammalian systems. So thank you very much. <laughs> Again, we have time for only a single question. All right. That's so, great. everybody is ready for the coffee break, and thank you again. Thank you.